cannot deny Mr. McCutcheon his right to associate as a new candidate at that the head squad non club in the past. And I'm pretty sure you're only guessing any history. Well, well, we'll find out. Rich Robinson is here. I mean, Rich, you know, when you take a look at the ruling and what the potential implications are, do you agree with Mr. Backer? Well, I'll say this, uh, Craig. Today, with tongue firmly in cheek, I'm celebrating the end of political corruption because Chief Justice Roberts has defined it out of existence. Uh, this ruling was based on the idea that the only political corruption there is is quid pro quo corruption. So. Uh, if there's ever another instance of political corruption, I suspect it'll be when the contract between the donor and the supplicant politician is released to the public. Uh, this is some kind of fantasy. I mean, La Cosa Nostra collecting protection money from a, a, a store owner does not have a contract. Uh, it's an implied contract. And absolutely, uh, somebody can give $3.6 million, $3 million to all the candidates and all the state party committees and the federal committees and uh, another half million dollars to the party committees the next year. They could also spend another $6 million by giving everybody in Congress who has a leadership pack the maximum amount annually. And if you think that is not corrupting, uh, we've got a very naive and low definition of what corruption is. Uh, uh, Mr. Backer, um, you know, there was an interesting part of the ruling where, uh, you know, Chief Justice Roberts suggested that, uh, you know, the individual, the, the limits uh, that to individual candidates of $2,600 would stay in place, uh, saying that that was the most important important part when it comes to corruption because no individual politician uh, can be plied with, say, that $3 million uh, from an individual donor. Uh, Talk a little bit about that part of this and, and whether or not this does indeed still prevent uh, the type of influence that Mr. Robinson is talking about. Well, you know, I think Mr. Robinson and I have a fundamental disagreement here, and I actually want to ask him a question. The court has defined corruption for the purposes of political speech as actual quid pro quo corruption or apparent quid pro quo corruption. And quid pro quo is I'm giving you money and you are giving me an official act in the state. That is the definition of corruption as the court understands it. Uh, and I'd like to ask Mr. Robinson how he would define corruption in the context of the country fine. Uh, Rich, you okay with that well, question? Uh, sure, let me give you a contemporary example here. Chris Christie goes to the Sheldon primary in Las Vegas, uh, makes the full cause uttering the words occupied territories, for which he uh, retracts, apologizes, and retreats to New Jersey to have the OT words banned from all public documents in New Jersey. That's corruption. I mean, that's somebody following the trail of money to say, this is what I will do as your president with foreign policy. That's an interesting example, Dan. But what exactly is the corruption that is here? So, Chris Christie wants somebody's support, and you're saying that he was doing, what is the official act that he was doing and where is the money coming from would be the Roberts Court's view on this. I'm asking you how you define it, not in some, you know, in a particular example, but as a matter of law, which has to be objective and really separated from the post ante examples. As a matter of law, how do you want to define corruption? So, so that's an interesting question here. How do you define corruption? I mean, it, implied uh, action on the part of, of somebody like Christie in this in instance that you know, he changes his policy based on the fact that he's not going to be able to raise enough money for his campaign if he doesn't. Is that in itself, does that count as corruption? That seems to be, I guess, at the heart of this question, Rich. I think a lot of the pressure is implied. And so the Congress, who have experience in politics, judge that having anybody own more than $123,000 in a two-year election cycle was an invitation to corruption. Now, the, the super legislature, the Supreme Court, or the Pope of the uh, American Church of the Almighty Dollar has decided that Congress doesn't know anything about politics. He knows about politics. The idea that the First Amendment is absolute is not true. Go back and look at Citizens United and read Justice Stevens' dissent. There are all kinds of limitations on the First Amendment, and it's not just yelling fire in a crowded theater. Dan. Well, yes, and I think if you read the very first line of the majority's opinion, it, um, I believe it starts, I'm actually pulling it up, ah, oh darn, you know I can't find my copy of it, 
and basically starts off with the premise that uh, the Supreme that, that the First Amendment is an absolute. There there are exceptions that can be made. And what we're saying, uh, what the court's jurisprudence has always been, is that to prevent corruption, you can trim around the edges of the First Amendment when it comes to political speech and the use of money as a mechanism to achieve that. But you're still not really answering my question, which is, if you don't like the quid pro quo definition of corruption, how do you, as a matter of law, define what corruption is so that we can have an objective rule? 